by Jeff's house twice yesterday. We had a big, we had a big tractor ride over there, but in Lane Street, we met at the Surrey over there, and Lane Park. I mean, we had two hours. We were like all the way out to the west. As far as we could go. Tractors. Only 12. Only 12. But they put up on Facebook, I guess, and everywhere we met, so it's fancy. So I think I'm going to be the way. St. Sunday, it's like unbelievable. Sir. Yeah, I am. That Thanks. was loud. Nancy, go. Nancy, go. Dad. You ready? Yes. Go. Go. Good morning and welcome from our Savior's Lutheran Church in Roy, Utah. Pastor Bruce Gratz here. And uh, just welcoming you to our service today. And we pray and trust as you worship with us online. We'll be drawn closer to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Closer to us as a church family. A community of faith. We're just so glad you've joined us. It's a beautiful day here this morning. In the gospel this morning is about uh, Jesus saying, I'm the vine, we're the branches, we have to be the family. His Father's uh, will is that for us to bear much fruit. So that's what the sermon will be on, and I hope you will enjoy that. Uh, if you do want to contribute uh, to the ministry here, you can go online to our website, www.oslcroy.com, and there's a button there to contribute. Thanks so much for watching, uh, watching this morning and being with us online. Have a great day. Good morning, everybody. Uh, last week we celebrated some birthdays, and uh, my Kofu and I didn't even realize it was Trent's birthday last Sunday. So we're going to sing over there. Yeah.
www.oslcbrewery.com and there's a little tab there you can click. We welcome our online audience as well. So glad you can worship with us this morning. You can be out in the building with us. So let's begin with our call to worship. Let's all stand. Say the glory of God.
gather this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When you say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us take a brief moment and ask the Holy Spirit to show us where we fall short of God's standard of holiness. Confess those sins and receive the forgiveness that we have in the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Most merciful God, we confess that we are bound to sin and cannot fear ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us. mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
other side of the it. It's 1 John 4, verses 1 through 11. And hear the word of the Lord. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This concludes the first reading. Let us all stand for the gospel this morning from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Here Jesus is speaking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. June. June. Biggest moving day. 
Right in. Right. I don't know what that means, matters, but anyhow. Uh, did you know the average person will change careers five to seven times during their working life, according to career change statistics? With an increasing number of career choices, 30% of the workforce uh, will, um, will now change careers or jobs every 12 months. In the U.S., how long is the average marriage? Five years. <laughs> That's pretty close. Yeah. 8.2 years. <clears throat> this is the average time for marriage to divorce. The average time between marriage and separation is seven years. It's a seven-year age. The Pew Research Center found that Protestant individuals, anyone who identified as non-Catholic but Christian, uh, included 74% of all Christians and had a divorce rate of approximately 51% out of a sample of 4,700 individuals. So Christians have a hard time staying in their marriages as well. There's even a new wave of Christian personalities who are deconstructing their faith. Josh Harris comes to mind, a pastor of the Sovereign Grace Church in Maryland. He wrote the best seller about Christian dating, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And in July of 2019, he, he renounced his faith, divorced his wife, and is no longer a pastor. In 2020, Rhett and Link, two Christian social media YouTube stars, they were youth pastors at one time, with over 16 million subscribers to the Good Mythical Morning podcast, renounced their Christian faith and are now agnostics. Staying power, what is it? What do we call staying power? It's an important aspect of any relationship. We might call it determination, stamina, endurance, fortitude, indefatigability, and grit. From the stats I cited for both Americans and Christians, it looks like staying power is no longer a big value that we all share. From moving to career changes, to divorce, to abandoning the faith, it seems like very few people, including Christians, have staying power. Now, I'm not casting judgment on anyone who's moved, changed their career, divorced, or left the faith. I'm merely observing for whatever reasons it's difficult for people to stay in the same place, career, marriage, or faith. But this morning, I want to focus on staying in the faith once delivered to all the saints. Here in our gospel passage this morning, John 15, 1 through 8, we see how Jesus wants our faith to have staying power. It's easy in this COVID era to let our faith slip through our fingers. It's much easier and less fearful to stay at home than to go to worship. It's much easier to read about politics 24-7 than to read our Bibles. It's much easier to think that we've been believers so long, for so many years, that we can get along without worshiping or communion. But Satan would have us believe that we can stand strong in the faith because we always have. That's a lie for sure. Look at Peter who said he goes to the cross for Jesus, yet he denied Christ three times. Jesus starts the passage by saying, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. The question needs to be asked, then, who is the false vine? The vine was the supreme symbol of Israel. In Psalm 80, 16, the vine is burned with fire. Israel failed God's purpose for it to be a light to the Gentiles. In contrast, Jesus is the true vine. He was the obedient son through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. Pastor Bruce Mill in his commentary on John says that the vine also is a utilitarian plant. It exists to bear fruit. The vine exists to give its life blood. Its flower is small. Its fruit abundant. And when the fruit is mature and the vine has become for a moment glorious, the treasure of the grapes is torn down and the vine is cut right back to the stem. Often preachers and commentators discuss this passage in a way that refers to the inward condition of our souls as though abiding in him was the goal for Christ's disciples. The goal is stated clearly in verse 8 where Jesus says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. The disciples are to continue Jesus' mission as the new Israel, the true vine, to proclaim the promise that you're the Messiah. All nations of the world will be blessed. That salvation is found in no other name under heaven given among men but the name Christ Jesus. 
But what will enable believers to produce the fruit that glorifies the Father? First, believers don't produce any fruit. He tells us in verse 5, without me, Jesus, you can do nothing. When I went to Bible college, I had to do any number of things to prove that I was a true disciple. I was taught that if I got up at 4 a.m., had devotions, read my Bible, prayed, witnessed to others, that I would automatically bear fruit. But I can honestly say, if you are not doing those allegedly spiritual, if you are doing those allegedly spiritual activities in your own ability, your own strength, or for others to see what a wonderful disciple you are, those activities will lead to no fruit bearing. They led me to spiritual pride and self-righteousness. Because God the Father wants as much fruit as possible for his disciples to manifest, he prunes us repeatedly of our pride and self-righteousness. He prunes in two ways. First, he cuts off withered, dry branches from the vine. Jesus tells us that the Father cuts off every branch in him that does not bear any fruit. This is the most radical form of pruning he uses. In verse 6, Jesus tells us that these branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. This alleged disciple has not remained in Christ, has gone their own way, and never really was a disciple. Jesus may be referring here to those like Judas, who appeared as a branch. But when temptation came, proved they were withered, dried up, and not attached to the true vine, Jesus. He was thrown into the eternal fire of hell, as every branch that isn't attached to Jesus is. Jesus also mentions those who look like disciples but aren't. In 1 John 2, 18 and 19, John warns believers, dear children, this is the last hour. And as you've heard that the end of Christ is coming, even now many antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belong to us. Within every community of faith, there are probably those who when Christ comes will be exposed as dead branches. The Father cuts off those branches that bear no fruit. They are nothing but dead, dry, and withered up. Why did they wither up? They never were disciples to begin with. They never believed that Jesus died in their place to pay for their sins so they would be forgiven for all eternity through him. Possibly they wanted to be part of the disciples' community of faith the part of the local church that never were broken to the point where they realized how spiritually bankrupt they were, so they never received Jesus as their Messiah, as their Savior. In any event, they didn't abide, remain, reside, or stay in Christ because they were never in Christ by faith. So God the Father simply removes them from the vineyard. But for those who are true disciples, God the Father prunes, trims, or cleanses the branches Jesus' true disciples to make them more fruitful. How does he prune them? Cleanse us so that we bear more fruit. He tells the disciples, you are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. It's through his word that the Lord primarily cleanses us every day. We know this because Jesus uh, told us in John 17, 17 in his high priestly prayer to his father, that the word is the means by which we are sanctified, made more like Jesus. And Hebrews 4.12 tells us the word is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. As Pastor Milton tells us, as that word works in us, we become in a new way attractive and authentic in our Christian living and witness. But God the Father also uses hard circumstances and trials to prune us of our pride and self-righteousness as well. God has used my knee replacements to do this in my life. He's done it more with the second knee replacement than the first. The first one was really nothing, no real pain. Doing real well in physical therapy. My therapist said I crushed it, and I was walking very well within two weeks. I proved to myself that I could get through any trial, because as my dad would say, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. That is not in the Bible. <laughs> How's that for a spiritual approach, huh? So I don't think much fruit was produced 
due to the first knee replacement. When the second knee that was done on April 9th, much more so. Surgery went well, but the recovery has been difficult, more bruising and bleeding than the first knee. Uh, I, I want to thank my wife, Minuet, and kiddos for putting up with me, because I've been cranky, to say the least, and for their constant help. That spasms in my right hand until yesterday, and I'm not having any this morning, so that's a good thing. The only way I could sleep was to take meds, and uh, I'm not a fan of that. But the take pain would not let me sleep for long, or stay asleep for long. I realized there was no way I could recover without the Lord's help. I cried out to him for help one night about 3 a.m. to get through the pain, and sometimes I would just pound my fist into my hand because it hurt so much. I felt out of control continually as each spasm came. No matter how much I stretched my knee to my leg, the spasm continued. But the Lord assured me he was there in the midst of my pain. And once I realized that he was with me, my attitude got much better. What I realized and God taught me again is that my healing and recovery will not be in my time. It will take patience that I don't have. It will take patience that only the Holy Spirit can produce in my life. You see, fruit bearing isn't a human possibility. It's Christ's work in us through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Remember the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22 is the fruit that belongs to the Spirit and is produced by the Spirit in us. That fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God has used my second knee surgery to bring more patience into my life for sure. According to Jesus, the spiritual realities are obvious. Separate from Christ, no fruit. United to Christ, much fruit. Jesus tells us in this passage, unless we remain, abide, stay, reside in him, we will not bear any fruit. The Greek verb meno, remain, stay, reside, appears seven times in these eight verses. So we can assume it is important to Jesus that we get this. How do we have staying power to remain in Jesus so we bear much fruit? We're being his word daily. Partake of the sacrament of the altar and pray. I know Kevin Barb Mickelson, and many of you know Kevin Barb. Kevin's 98, Barb's 90, and they're there in their apartment every day. And whenever I go to visit them, and I know they told Marty this and John this and Elton this, they get into God's word together. Every day they read the scriptures. They have a devotional they read to each other, and on Sundays they go through all four lectionary readings. They are such an encouragement to me in my faith. I am blessed every time I go to see them. You see, Jesus assumes that if we remain in him and his word abides in us, we can ask for whatever we want and he will give it to us. If we're abiding in him and his word abides in us, we will only ask according to his will and that prayer he will answer for sure. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first men to walk on the moon in the Apollo 11 space mission. Michael Collins, the third member of the group, was in charge of the command module, essential for the return to Earth. It circled the moon while Armstrong and Aldrin landed. The moon lander touched down at 3.17 Eastern Standard Time, Sunday, July 20th, 1969. Aldrin brought with him a tiny communion kit given him by his church that had a silver chalice and wine vial about the size of the tip of his finger. During the morning, he radioed, Houston, this is Eagle. This is the Ellen Pilot speaking. I would like to request a few moments of silence. I would like to invite each person listening in, whoever or wherever he may be, <coughs> to contemplate for a moment the events of the last few hours and to give thanks in his own individual way. In the radio blackout, he wrote later, I opened the little plastic packages which contained the bread and the wine. I poured the wine into the chalice our church had given me. In the one-sixth gravity of the moon, the wine slowly curled and gracefully came up the side of the cup. Then I read the scripture, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me will bring forth much fruit. I had intended to read my communion passage back to earth, but at the last moment, Deke Slayton had requested that I not do this. NASA was already embroiled in a legal battle with Madeline Murray O'Hare, the celebrated opponent of the legal 
over the Apollo 8 crew reading from Genesis while orbiting the moon at Christmas. I agreed reluctantly. Eagle's metal body creaked. I ate the tiny host and swallowed the wine. I gave thanks for the intelligence and spirit that had brought two young pilots to the sea of tranquility. It was interesting for me to think the very first liquid ever poured on the moon and the very first food eaten there were the communion elements. Abiding in Christ through communion and the word were very, very important to Buzz Aldrin. The question is, how about you and me? Is abiding in Christ important to us? To where we want to get into his word? To where we want to partake of communion every chance we get? If you haven't been abiding in Christ, confess that this morning. Realize you will only abide in him as you get into his word. Partake of holy communion and pray. He will lead us when we remain in him. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you realize that only He can produce His fruit in you. For without Him and Jesus, we can't produce anything spiritually. God's purpose for you and for me is to bear much fruit. And may God give us the grace and staying power to remain in Him, no matter what. So we are fruit bearing Christians and not religious nuts. And all God's people say, Amen.
Now let's say the creed together. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He ascended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up our hearts. We live unto the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. She is right to give God thanks and praise. We need right and sanitary, we should at all times and in all places. Give uh, offer thanks and praise to his holy name and the saints on earth and the host in heaven. Join in their understanding. Amen.
the body of Christ given for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Bye. Bye.